Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Paul Gullickson, Communications Manager for the County of Sonoma. Today is Wednesday, April 5th, and this is the last in a series of recorded COVID-19 community updates that we've been providing over the past three years during the pandemic. I would like to welcome Sonoma County's outgoing health officer, Dr. Sundari Mace, who will be leaving us at the end of this week for a new position within the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Mace has been with the county since uh, March 2020, at the very beginning of the pandemic. Over the past three years, she has worked closely with the, the Board of Supervisors, county staff, as well as community leaders and healthcare professionals throughout the region um, to keep the community informed and to keep Sonoma County residents safe. Dr. Mace, we thank you for all you've done and, and we wish you all the best in your new endeavor. And uh, before we leave, we've asked you to, if you'd provide one more COVID update, as well as some final thoughts of, on, of after what we've learned during the pandem pandemic, as well as any other parting uh, thoughts you have for the community. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Paul. I really appreciate the introduction. Before I talk more about where I'll be going next, I would like to present an overview of our successes, accomplishments, and challenges over the past three years, and then end with some important public health initiatives for the future. Let me share my screen. Great, can you see this okay? All right, okay, so let's see where, we're be where we've been and where we're going. So what I'm gonna do over the next uh, 20 minutes is to provide a little overview of uh, the global and local impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, the current status of COVID-19 here in Sonoma County, our vaccination progress, lessons learned over the course of the pandemic, and some recommended prevention measures for the community moving forward. And then I do wanna to touch base on some other non-COVID related public health initiatives that are a priority. So if you look at the global impacts of COVID-19, uh, they're significant. As you can see here, COVID-19 has caused more than 6.88 million deaths worldwide and 1.2 million deaths in the United States. So we've really had the lion's share of deaths here in the US. More people have died from COVID-19 than from AIDS or the 1918 influenza pandemic. And more importantly, we've observed the largest drop in life expectancy since World War II. And we've seen health disparities and those health disparities exist. Um, we've seen um, a disproportionate number of deaths amongst people of color and vulnerable populations as well. So as you can see here from the graph, here in California, we've had 12 million cases and over 100,000 deaths. And in Sonoma County, we've had 115,000 cases and 553 deaths. We have done really well in terms of vaccination, thanks to the community. We've had the ninth highest vaccination rate in the state. And as a result of that and other interventions, Sonoma County has experienced 20% fewer cases per 100,000 individuals than California overall, and 57% fewer deaths per 100,000 than California overall. And that really is a testament to our county and the residents and how well we've been able to do during this pandemic. However, as I noted before, there's been inequities in infection risk. As you can see here, and we've said this from the very beginning, essential workers, residents of color, residents living in the lowest quartile have experienced disproportionately high case rates. Latinx residents have accounted for 42% of all cases, while they represent 29% of the population. So definitely uh, noted health disparities that existed before COVID-19, but were really um, highlighted during the pandemic. And you can see here Pacific Islanders and African-American Black 
individuals, American Indian, Alaska Native individuals, and Asians have also had disproportionate numbers of cases. Hospitalizations have really impacted the elderly. And if you recall, at the beginning of the pandemic, when vaccines became available, we prioritize vaccines for those 75 and older first, and then those 65 and older. And I believe those are life-saving interventions. Our 65 plus year olds have experienced the highest rates of hospitalizations. And during the Delta wave, the 50 to 64 year olds also had very high hospitalization rates. And of note, Latinx residents have been hospitalized at higher rates than white non-Hispanic residents adjusted for age. So uh, we have done our best, I think, uh, as a community to try to protect these vulnerable populations. This is a very important slide. We're looking at local life expectancy. COVID-19 was the sixth leading cause of death in 2021. And for Latinx residents, COVID-19 was the number one leading cause of death in 2021 and the second leading cause of death in 2020. As compared to the prior three years to the pandemic, that's 2017 through 19, life expectancy decreased by 1.7 years in Sonoma County residents in 2021. And, and that's a really big um, hallmark. And I think it's something that uh, hopefully we'll never see again. If you look at the racial ethnic disparities in life expectancy, you'll see that the Latinx had a 2.2 year decrease in life expectancy compared with the white non-Hispanic population that had a 1.4 year decrease. And there were gender disparities as well. Males had a 2.3 year decrease in life expectancy versus females who had a 0.9 year decrease in um, life expectancy. And these things can be explained by many factors uh, that I can't go into right now, but uh, more research will tell us why we have these, these differences. If you look at our current metrics as of April 4th, 2023, we now have 3.9 new cases per 100,000 residents per day, 7.5% overall test positivity, and 5.9% test positivity in the lowest HPI quartile. That's the lowest um, of the score that looks at many factors that determine the socioeconomic status of, of individuals. And that's good because we're lower than we have been in the last month or two. 27 people are currently hospitalized with COVID and 31 people have died from COVID since October 1st, 2022. So if you look at it in context, you'll see that we did have a blip, an increase in case rates per 100,000 at the end of last year. And that has been decreasing, especially in the last two months. So um, if you look at this graph, the blue line represents California overall. The orange line represents the Bay Area counties and the green line represents Sonoma County. So we've actually done better than California State overall, as well as the Bay Area counties overall in terms of our case rates. And it really is a testament to our community and uh, our practices. Now, if you look at case rates by city, you can see that the highest case rates are currently being observed in Sebastopol and Cloverdale. But the good news is case rates are coming down everywhere, as you can see from these graphs even in our more populous areas uh, like Santa Rosa or like Roanoke Park. So the trend is definitely downwards at this time. Wastewater surveillance. Let me say a little bit about wastewater surveillance. Every uh, catchment area, usually city, has a wastewater plant and everybody's wastewater from their homes goes to that plant. And it's a great way for us to measure diseases in a whole catchment area like a city. So we can test the wastewater that is coming from all the different residences in that city that comes to that wastewater plant and look for different kinds of diseases. 
COVID is only one of those diseases. For example, we can look at influenza or respiratory syncytial virus as well. Now, when wastewater samples show increasing levels of these viruses or bacteria, if we're, say, measuring um, some other illnesses, you'll see that wastewater increases usually precede the actual case increases in the community, in that city area. So in other words, when wastewater goes up, we're worried that we're gonna have increases of cases in that area. And you can see here, respiratory syncytial virus peaked and then has pretty much uh, gone down to uh, zero at this point. We're not seeing wastewater. We're able to track the wastewater in Santa Rosa, Roner Park, in Petaluma, and in Windsor at this time. Influenza also is pretty much gone from our spectrum at this time. Um, and that's what we expect usually by April. COVID, we have no experience with in the past. And so wastewater is very helpful. As you see, we've been up and down and up and down. Recently, there's a downward trend in Santa Rosa and in Petaluma Luma, and in Windsor as well. So this is all good for now and we'll continue to monitor wastewater so we can provide recommendations for the county. Now, wastewater also allows us to track different variants. We can measure new variants of COVID-19 as they occur in the population. And the data that we have is largely now from wastewater results. Uh, currently, the Omicron BQ and XBB subvariants are dominant in the county. And these new subvariants, as we've been saying for now quite a while, are more transmissible, but they have not been associated with more severe outcomes like hospitalization or death. And that's probably due to vaccination. So let me pause right now to again underscore the importance of vaccination. And it would be really important for everybody, if you've not had your latest booster, and that would be the bivalent booster that's specific against Omicron, to go get that booster. It will protect you against the newer variants of COVID-19. If you take a look at local hospitalizations for influenza and COVID-19, you'll see that after November peak in influenza hospitalizations, these hospitalizations declined. So hospitalizations are on the lower graph, ICU patients on the upper graph, and the sort of green, bluish green color is influenza, and the yellowish color is actually is COVID-19. So we've recently mainly been seeing hospitalizations due to COVID-19. Now, if you look at ICU uh, beds, the kind of pink red is actually influenza patients in, in the ICU versus the blue are COVID patients, and the light blue is all other patients who are in the ICU. So we did have a kind of an increase in the COVID ICU uh, beds, patients in ICU beds, but that has decreased, and we're not seeing influenza any longer in the ICU. Again, as of April 4th, we had zero people hospitalized for influenza and 27 hospitalized uh, for COVID. And some of these people are incidental, meaning they went in for a procedure, uh, like a colonoscopy or, say, a, a minor surgical procedure, and they were found to have COVID. Now, this is a very, very important graph that's going to show us the impact of vaccination amongst our elderly, felt very vulnerable population, those people in the skilled nursing facilities or the res residential care facilities for the elderly. So um, I'm just gonna point out a few really important facts here. Initially, before vaccines were available, you can see that we had a lot of cases in the skilled nursing facilities and the RCFEs, and we had a lot of deaths mirroring the numbers of cases. So um, a full, uh, potentially about, 20% uh, of those who were getting COVID in these facilities were actually succumbing to COVID as well. Then we had our first fully vaccinated residents. And remember, we did prioritize this population for vaccination. And you can see cases dropped significantly after vaccination. 
And although we saw some deaths, we really limited the number of deaths in this population after vaccination. Then we got the Delta surge with a new variant of COVID. And although we saw an increase in cases, we did not see a significant increase in deaths. Again, largely attributable to vaccination in this very vulnerable population. Then we had Omicron and we had huge numbers of cases, but again, limited number of deaths. And this was even before the bivalent vaccine that was specific uh, against Omicron. So vaccinate, this is the vaccination story for all of you to understand. Vaccination had a huge impact in protecting our most vulnerable population uh, in whom we were seeing the greatest deaths. So this is a success, success story and I just wanna highlight that for everybody. Overall, we've done quite well with vaccine administration. As you can see, uh, we in Sonoma County, um, we have administered 1.282 million uh, daily average cases, that is doses. And we have about 80% uh, of our population that has gotten the primary series of vaccination. 68% had the primary series and had one of the two initial boosters. And we have about 32% of our population that's gotten the bivalent booster. These numbers are all significantly higher than the rest of uh, overall that is California. So we're doing quite well. As I said, initially, we have the ninth highest vaccination rate. Now, if you look at demographics, we're still having some health inequities and disparities. As you can see, um, still we have a disparity with the Latinx population not being as vaccinated as our white non-Hispanic population. So we're definitely seeing disparities here. And uh, the good news is we're doing quite well in vaccinating our 65 plus population. And in fact, all of our older adult populations, we still have some work to do in the lower age groups, especially uh, the zero to four age group and uh, the five to 11. And uh, we are, have some disparities in terms of the Healthy Places Index. This is all state data. It looks a little different than our own data, but as you can see, we'll still have some work to do in terms of um, catching up. So what did we learn from the pandemic? We learned a lot of things, but I'm just gonna highlight a few things. We followed the data and I have to thank our epidemiology team Catherine Pack and her group for giving us uh, really great data that was real time and on which we could make decisions. The data has informed all of our practices. Testing, vaccine, public health policy des decisions has been very helpful. We were constantly pivoting uh, to respond to different situations, uh, different needs or different stages in our vaccine effort and just generally our response to COVID-19. We've had expanded communication. And I have to, again, um, plug, you know, our uh, PIO group, our public information officers have, for just being so on the ball with getting information out in a timely manner to the community, to all of our share, uh, stakeholders. We've shared information to with the state, with different organizations, with our Sonoma County Office of Education, fire law and EMS, and with all of you in the community and other stakeholders. We've also had a great collaboration with our healthcare systems that I hope will continue after the pandemic. We've worked with our hospital-based systems, our federally qualified health centers, our free clinics, the um, Santa Rosa Junior College, student clinic, pharmacies. We've had a really great network at, that we've built uh, with great interactions and ongoing communication. I must plug our trusted messengers that we've worked so closely with. That is our vaccine equity group, um, our health equity groups um, that have really informed a lot of the decisions to ensure that we're meeting the needs of um, vulnerable populations, our people of color, 
uh, our elderly and uh, other such populations. Uh, we have worked with community-based organizations, community health workers, and promotoras to help reduce the disparities that have existed, to provide information and resources. We have actually done a lot of listening, taken input from community groups that was essential to identify our gaps, our areas for improvement in reaching different community sectors. And um, we've learned a lot of lessons. I mean, I've already highlighted some of them. The community outreach and education through our community health workers and our promotoras will definitely help to extend education for the community beyond our current hospital and outpatient services model. And we need to continue, not just with COVID-19, but with all aspects of public health and behavioral health to improve health outcomes, reduce disparities in our community. So COVID-19 uh, really has become endem endemic. Almost everybody has either had COVID or been vaccinated. And in fact, those who have been vaccinated and have had COVID probably at this point um, are the most immune to the virus. So it's part of our health landscape. I'm sure everybody still knows people who are getting COVID, but it's becoming like other respiratory illnesses like influenza, like uh, RSV, um, that is just part of what we're gonna be seeing in the future. We will continue ongoing close surveillance. We will expect to see new mutations, new variants, and we'll track them. And we'll continue uh, to see if we need to do anything to mitigate um, the bad outcomes from these different variants. And uh, as I said, we have high levels of protection in the community. We may have another vaccine. We're still waiting to hear from the bodies that determine uh, whether uh, new vaccines will be available. Um, that would be the NIH, the FDA, et cetera. And uh, if we have a new vaccine, I highly recommend everybody to get that vaccine. Um, and we're just streamlining interventions now to maximize our impact moving forward for COVID. And most importantly, health equity is um, in our future. It's very important in all of our public health interventions. And we're going to not only target interventions for those who still face the greatest threats from COVID, but try to close the gap in terms of health, health inequities and disparities in all aspects of public health and behavioral health. Which brings me uh, to the next slide, recommended prevention measures. Um, I've already said some of these things. Please stay up to date on vaccinations as they come out. It's your decision to wear facial coverings based on the level of the community spread and your risk. And if you're a vulnerable person who uh, is worried, then you absolutely can wear a mask in um, public indoor settings, especially in crowded settings, or avoid gatherings. Those are still things that you can do for yourself and your family. If you live with somebody who's vulnerable, you may consider the same. And then hygiene measures and uh, good ventilation is important. Of course, if you're ill, the best thing is still to stay at home, test for COVID, but also test and see your doctor for other potential illnesses. And um, we our antigen tests are available now at pharmacies. Um, there are many programs by which you can get antigen tests through insurance or, other, or otherwise. And so I highly recommend that you still test if need be. So now I'm going to shift um, to my last uh, uh, slide here, which is going to talk about other initiatives and priorities for public health. Uh, now that um, COVID-19 is a part of our future landscape and we don't have orders, it's not an emergency at this time, we need to focus on the other important uh, interventions that we need to look at in public health. And one, as many of you know, is the opioid crisis. Um, that's been in the news a lot, and it's really affected our county as well. We are uh, working with stakeholders to ensure that we have the reversal drug for opioid overdoses called Narcan. And we're trying to ensure that we're able to distribute um, Narcan in different settings, such as in schools, for example. In fact, all of our schools now 
do have Narcan available if they have a potential overdose. Uh, we're providing training education in different venues, not just schools, but many different groups to understand the issue and know how it can be mitigated. Mental health initiatives are really important, especially in the post-COVID phase. Um, many people had um, many more uh, mental health issues during COVID due to isolation, especially our elders, our school children. And so we really need to focus on these initiatives and focus on suicide prevention. As I've already pointed out, health equity is one of the main priorities in public health at this time to protect our vulnerable population and address disparities. Climate change is very important. We're already seeing the impacts of climate change uh, locally, nationally, and globally. That's something that needs to be on the radar. And here in Sonoma County, especially disaster preparedness and response to fires, floods, as we've seen over the past years is very important. And hopefully we won't have another pandemic, but we need to be prepared. Health systems integration or looking at the whole in terms of health systems, the whole person and all the aspects of health systems and health care provision is really important. So I'm gonna stop there and um, I uh, thank everybody for the past three years. I do wanna um, say that as Paul mentioned at the out outset, this will be my last presentation for the community here in Sonoma. I have taken a new position with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It's a division of global migration quarantine. I'm going to serve as a team lead medical officer to the quarantine and travel epidemiology team. And I'm gonna be returning to national and international work in infectious disease, including tuberculosis. And I've really been honored to have been able to serve Sonoma County during an unprecedented pandemic. I would like to thank all of you, the residents of Sonoma County, for helping to protect our community and save lives. I wish everyone continued health and well-being. Thank you all. <laughs>